yes many times a non derivative contract may include a derivative contract such kind of a derivative contract uh, we refer that as an embedded derivative what we are saying is that your main contract your main contract is non derivative contract so your main contract is a non derivative contract but this non derivative contract accompanies it accompanies with a derivative contract this type of a derivative contract we refer that as an embedded derivative so we have a main contract you enter into the main contract whether you like it or not you also become a part of the derivative contract then such derivative contract is referred as a derivative which is stitched into the main contract it's a part and parcel of the main contract then we say it's an embedded derivative why are we discussing this point the point that we are discussing is that if a main contract has a derivative contract should i account for this contract as a hybrid contract that means as a contract as a whole or should i separate the derivative then the host contract will be accounted separately and the derivative contract will be accounted separately so is separation required or not that is the accounting issue that we are discussing over here so first of all let's be very clear with what we mean by an embedded derivative i may or may not be interested in the derivative contract i am actually interested in the main non derivative contract but the nature of the contract is such that it also accompanies a derivative contract such a derivative contract as i was saying earlier also is a part and parcel of the main contract such derivatives are referred as embedded derivative but the accounting issue is should i account for this contract as a whole or should i account the non derivative separately and the derivative separately so that is the accounting issue let's see what does it say page 87 Well, it says an embedded uh, an embedded derivative is a compound uh, component of a hybrid instrument, which also includes a non-derivative host contract. Non-derivative. This main contract, I can also call it as the host contract. And this host contract, as I was saying, is also including a derivative contract. The whole contract we are referring as a hybrid instrument. And there are two cases over here: case one and case two. I will like to discuss case two first. So case two. If you read case two, they are saying if a hybrid contract contains a host that is not an asset within the scope of this term. So your host contract, they use this word, host contract is not an asset. It is not an asset. That basically means it will turn out to be a liability. Right. So they are saying if a hybrid contract contains a host that is not an asset within the scope of this particular standard, fine. So it is not an asset over here. So we can say it is a liability. Think in this way: there is ABC Limited. It issues convertible bond. Why right. it issues a convertible bond? What it says is for five years we will pay eight percent interest. and at end of 5 years right at end of 5 years it says that investors will have option option 1 demand cash option 2 demand equity shares so this particular bond will get converted into equity shares so this is the kind of instrument that you have issued so you are issuing a convertible bond this bond as you can see will pay interest for 5 years and at the end of the 5 years we are giving an option to the investors we are telling the investors that see after 5 years if you want cash we are ready to give you cash and at the end of 5 years if you are interested in equity shares we are ready to convert it into equity shares let us say the ratio is also decided 1 is to 5 so for every 5 bonds held we will convert it into one equity share so it's going to get converted into a fixed number of equity shares 
irrespective of the market price which is prevailing at that point of time. This is a perfect example of an embedded derivative over here. Right? First try to identify which is the host contract over here. Host contract, the main contract. Tell me. What is the host contract over here? The host contract is the bond that you are issuing. So we are issuing bonds over there. And tell me, what is the derivative over here? Derivative. See, this option is turning out to be a derivative contract over here. You as an investor has a right to buy shares of the company. So the derivative over here is, I'm seeing it from the investor's viewpoint, right to buy shares of issuing company. So this company has issued the bonds. After five years, you have a right as an investor. You may demand cash, no problem. But you can also convert it into equity shares. So we are having a right to buy shares. So this is what we have over here. The host contract is a non-derivative contract, which is the bond. And the derivative is the right of buying shares of the issuing company. The entire convertible bond, we will understand as a hybrid instrument, right? We will say it's a hybrid instrument. Earlier, we were even calling this as a compound financial instrument. But in this context, we are saying it's a hybrid instrument. Here is an embedded derivative. This right of buying shares is a part and parcel of the convertible bond. Let's say you are an investor. You want to invest in this particular bond. You tell the company that, see, I'm not interested in shares. I have already made up my mind today itself that after five years, I want cash. So you tell the company that you exclude the derivative from this particular contract. As an investor, I have made up my mind. After five years, I want cash. I don't want equity shares at all. So please exclude this option. Is it possible for the company to exclude this option exclusively for you as an investor? It is not possible. Because there might be many other investors who might be interested in the shares. You are interested in cash. You have made up your mind from today itself that I am interested in cash. So what you are requesting the company is that why don't you exclude this derivative? It is not possible for the company to exclude this derivative. This derivative is a part and parcel of the host contract. And because it's a part and parcel of the host contract, it will be considered to be an embedded derivative. Question is, am I supposed to separate the derivative? Yes or no? That we will discuss further. The main thing was to understand what's a host contract and what's a derivative contract over here. So this derivative cannot be exclusively sold. It's a part and parcel of the main contract. It's an embedded derivative. And it will fall in case two. Why case two? Because you have issued a convertible bond. Issuing a convertible bond is not an asset. It's a liability. So that is the case two. What is case one? If a hybrid contract contains a host that is a financial asset within the scope of the standard, an entity shall apply the requirements of classification and measurement rules to the entire hybrid contract. Over here, there is some person, let us say Mr. XYZ. This person invests in the convertible bond. ABC Limited is issuing the convertible bond. And Mr. XYZ is investing in a convertible bond. You will now be able to understand the difference between case 1 and case 2 very clearly. Look at case 1. Hybrid contract has a host which is a financial asset. You are investing in a bond. If you are investing in a bond, it is a financial asset for you. So when you are seeing it from the viewpoint of investor, it will fall in case 1. Similarly, ABC Limited has issued the convertible bond. So when you see this contract from the viewpoint of ABC Limited, it will fall in case 2. Case 2 is the host is not an asset. When I buy a bond, it will be a financial asset. Case 1. And when I am issuing a bond, it is not an asset. So it will fall in case 2. What difference does it make? If you see case 1, they are saying you should apply the requirement of classification and measurement rules to the entire hybrid contract. In short, the embedded derivative is not to be separated. So if you have purchased a convertible bond, 
then the segregation into host contract and derivative contract is not required for the investor. So investor will account for this as a contract as a whole. So I am not supposed to do any separation. Case 2. If a hybrid contract is a host that is not an asset, that's the case 2, embedded derivative shall be separated. So I will have to separate the embedded derivative. As you can see, the derivative over here is to right of buying shares of the issuing company. But when will I do the separation? If and only if and three conditions. If three conditions are getting satisfied, then and then only the separation will be done. Look at the first one. The economic characteristics and risk of the embedded derivative are not closely related to economic characteristics and risk of the host. Okay. So look at the derivative. What is the derivative? The derivative over here is a right to buy shares. So I look at shares over here. And the host contract is bond. Look at, in for, uh, look at condition A. Economic characteristics and risk of the embedded derivative. So in our example, the economic characteristics and risk of the share is not closely related to the economic characteristics and risk of the host. Please see over here. The economic risk and the characteristics of bond, I will compare with the risk and the economic characteristics of shares. The two of them are absolutely different. They are significantly different. So condition A is getting satisfied. They are saying, look at condition A, are not closely related. Not closely related means they should be substantially different. The risk which is there when I invest in bond and the risk which is there when I invest in shares, there will be a dramatic difference between the risk. And that is the reason we can say that condition A is getting satisfied. Look at condition B. A separate instrument with the same terms as the embedded derivative would meet the definition of a derivative. Okay. Separately analyze the derivative contract. Tell me. Is it possible for me to enter into a similar kind of derivative separately? I'm not talking about this contract. Let us say I want to enter into a derivative which will give me a right of buying shares. Will such similar kind of derivative be available? The answer is yes. We have something known as a call option. Tell me, what is a call option? A call option is an option that will give you a right to buy shares of the issuing company. In other words, it is possible for us to enter into a similar kind of contract separately. So condition B is also getting satisfied. And finally condition C. The hybrid contract is not measured at fair value with changes in fair value recognized in profit or loss account. So what they are saying is that this hybrid contract that we have entered into it should not be, okay, FVTPL. It should not be classified as FVTPL. We know that when you are issuing a bond, uh, right, uh, uh, issuing a bond will give rise to a recognition of financial liability. And a financial liability will be classified as amortized cost, right? Compulsorily, it has to be classified as amortized cost, except for one short list which has been given to us. So we have decided not to classify the convertible bond as FVTPL. Look at C again. The hybrid contract is not measured at fair value with changes in fair value recognized in profit or loss. So what we are suggesting here is that the hybrid contract will be classified as other than FVTPL. Now you may wonder that why this kind of a condition is there. C. What we are saying is that this host contract and the derivative contract, the two should be separated. We are saying that. If you look at case two at the top, they are saying that they should be separated if and only if following conditions are getting satisfied. Now just assume for a moment that we are doing a separation. If you are doing a separation, then this derivative, you don't have a choice. Derivative in any case has to be classified as FVTPL. Because the derivative financial asset or a derivative financial liability is classified compulsorily as FVTPL. Now, if you are saying that no, host contract also I will classify as FVTPL, then what purpose will the separation serve? 
because if the entire contract is classified as FETPL, now you do separation. And after doing separation, you say that yes, bond I will account as FETPL and derivative also I'll account as FETPL. If both are to be accounted as FETPL, then why are you doing the separation in the first place? Basically, go for the entire hybrid contract classified as FETPL. Because even if I do all the separation, I do so many calculations, I do the separation, and then I say that yes. This main contract is also FETPL and the derivative is also FETPL, then separation is not serving any purpose. Yes, if you say host will be classified as amortized cost and the derivative as FETPL, then and then only the separation is making sense. So just see in our illustration, all the three conditions are getting satisfied. Condition number A, condition or rather it's a condition number one. You can observe on the board as well, right? The host contract is bond. Bond will have economic characteristics and risk. The derivative is for shares. Shares will also have economic characteristics and risk. But the risk of the bond and the risk of the share is not closely related. Condition A satisfied. Condition B. If I wish, I can enter into a separate call option which will give me a similar right of buying shares. In other words, the derivative has its own separate identity. And finally, C, please do not classify the entire hybrid instrument as FVTPL, right? Our purpose is that separate the derivative and recognize that as FVTPL and whatever is the host contract, the host contract will be recorded as something other than FVTPL. Uh, since we are saying in case two, that it should not be an asset, so it's a liability. And if it's a liability, then the only other choice that is left is amortized cost. So host contract I'll account as amortized cost and derivative will account as FVTPL. Let me make a slight change over here and suggest to you something in this way. Let us say there is a company which is issuing bond so there is ABC Limited which issues bonds and let us say it is for 5 years and after 5 years it says that redemption amount redemption amount is linked to interest rate index right it is saying that there will be an interest rate index and to the interest rate index uh, the amount of redemption is going to be linked. So for 5 years, let us say it is a 9% bond. So for 5 years, you will be paying 9% interest. And after 5 years, you are saying that we will redeem this particular bond. And when we will redeem this particular bond, the redemption amount that will be decided, uh, let us say it will be linked to the interest rate index. So something in this way. What the company is saying is that the options which the company is having is option 1, it will be redeeming it at par and option 2, at par plus let us say positive change in interest rate index. So it is promising its investors that see, we are ready to give you money at par. Let's say that if the interest rate index is down, then we will redeem the debenture or redeem the bond at par. But if the interest rate index is positive, then we are ready to give you some extra money. So this is the kind of derivative, that, uh, this is the kind of what we can say feature that you have attached to your port. So here also this options that we are getting is nothing but something like a derivative. We know derivative is something where you have an underlying and the value is fluctuating. No initial investment or very little initial investment is required and it is something that will be settled in future. So since all the three conditions are getting satisfied, uh, we can definitely say that it is turning out to be a derivative contract. Now again I would like to check over here whether all the three conditions are getting satisfied or not. If you look at the first condition now, the economic characteristics and risk of the bond. And this time the derivative is the interest rate index. See, bond and the interest rate index, they are closely related. 
If you remember in SFM also, we have done a topic like bonds. If you haven't done SFM, then you will be studying a topic like bonds in SFM. In SFM, we establish an inverse relationship between yields and the bond prices. Inverse relationship means if interest rates are rising, the bond prices will crash. And if the interest rates are falling, then the bond prices will be increasing. In other words, there is a close relationship between the bond prices and the interest rate index. So condition A will not get satisfied. Condition A is that the economic characteristic of the host contract in our example bond and the economic characteristics of the interest rate index, which is the derivative contract for us, the economic characteristics should not be closely related, but they are turning out to be closely related this time. The moment we say condition A is not satisfied, separation will not be required. I'm not even getting into whether B and C is getting satisfied because all the three have to be satisfied. Here A itself is not getting satisfied, so separation will not be necessary.